and I wanted to do a talk that was heavily neuroanatomical, but it was also quite clinical, because as neurologists, we're pragmatic. We have, we're interested in the neuroanatomy for our own ends. So I have um, created a talk that should go for about 40 minutes. I do run it on sometimes, and you can abbreviate me, in three parts. The first is a very brief overview of the human vision system from my perspective, from the perspective of what we see on the ward, because clearly it's the commonest, strokes, the commonest visual deficits we see are just visual field deficits following stroke. The second is a very brief case presentation of a patient who was in fairly recently, who are still on the ward, who presented with cortical blindness. And they're rare birds, we don't often see them, but I just wanted to show you why they're there and also how they often present, because they are bewildering and often take a while to diagnose. I think it's important that you understand the context of these patients presenting because they are ill. You often see them down the track when they're going to be tested, but these patients are very unwell when you first see them. And then I'm going to contrast this with the Riddick syndrome and emotional line side, so you get an idea of the differences. We're going to go from the retina back to the V1 to, to occipital cortex, up to the dorsal extra striate regions, and then we're going to go forward again into the back to the lateral nucleus and to the amygdala. I'm not going to talk about a whole range of things, so I'm not going to talk about neglect or acrotopsia or calamnomias, valence syndrome, even though they're fascinating, because these are rare in stroke. Alexia without agraphia, whilst, is, whilst strokes are commonest cause, we don't often see. The two basic tenets of neurology are always, we teach this still, we've taught this for over 100 years, uh, where is it and what is it? So neurologists are really only interested in the neuroanatomy for us to narrow it down. So it's important that you understand, I mean, we're interested in projections, etc., but we're really only interested because the where determines the what. The where narrows our differential diagnosis down very considerably. Now, in this context, I'm going to be talking about stroke, but it's, we're also interested in the where because the recovery mechanisms that occur in the human brain following stroke are very much driven by these other pathways, these non-classical pathways. So particularly the extra geniculostriate pathway you all know that the, 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 visual, the human visual system is a very widely distributed uh, system. It's probably a distributed attentional system. Some authors state that a third of the human cortex is served to some extent by visual or associated functions. And therefore, it's very commonly affected by stroke. Up to two thirds of patients have fleeting um, visual deficits following their stroke. And the major taught pathway, the one that we as neurologists often look at, is the one governing the visual is, is, is visual field deficits themselves. So these primary visual problems. These cu cuts are common after both anterior and posterior circulation strokes. Now this is something that probably isn't discussed a lot when we talk about anatomy, but for us as stroke neurologists, the vascular anatomy is essential because it, that really will determine, it, it gives us an idea of what the etiology of the stroke is going to be. The deficits follow the anatomy via decussations to the termination of striate cortex to a point. And this is very helpful because, again, the where determines the what, and therefore will also determine the etiology of the stroke. And we're interested in preventing those strokes. So just to clarify, this is an old uh, picture um, from previous talks, I'm mainly going to be talking about deficits that are caused following thrombotic or thromboembolic stroke. So not hemorrhage, not, not venous thrombosis. So I'm beginning to talk about the sort of strokes that occur after occlusion of the major cerebral, cerebral blood vessels or their branches, and not so much about hemorrhage, because hemorrhage is obviously a very variable risk. The distribution of embolic material that occurs within the stroke is, it, is dependent on a number of factors, but it really does, it, it is dependent on plumbing. And so if we think about the angulation of bifurcations and the flow within each uh, vascular branch, it makes sense that the largest caliber vessel that is most direct, that has the less bifurcations and the most flow, is going to be the one that has the most strokes. And this is actually true. The, the, the patients tend to have strokes that actually go up into their middle cerebral arteries, and this is because of the anatomy. If you look at this, um, this, this femur, um, this is something that shows the, the major blood vessels. The majority of strokes occur 
either from cardiac cells to make them quicker ration, from large artery embolus in the aortic arch, from carotid atheroma. If you look at the anatomy, this they tend to go up the internal carotid artery into the largest branches, which are the middle cerebral artery. So the majority of strokes, two thirds of strokes, are MCA strokes. The minority of strokes, one third of them, are in the posterior cerebral artery. If you think that they have to go into the subclavian artery or the, nomin or the nominate up the vertebral arteries into the basal artery, this is target territory in here. People often die if they have a large embolus that lodges there. So we don't see these as much. So in fact, catastrophic posterior circulatory strokes are not the people who do a bunch of study in here because they don't ask up there. The other thing to remember is how variable this anatomy is. It's, it's, it's hugely variable. Patients can have strokes that, that, that exactly the same size of stroke, but will have different, different outcomes from this because of the variability of their vascular tree and the variability in their plasticity. So whilst the where and the what are important, I think it's, it's important to understand there's no doubt that imaging has helped a lot. So this is a schema of what we think about when we're just thinking about straightforward um, uh, visual field counts. When we think we, we march backwards and the visual field deficit determines exactly where the stroke is. If they have a monocular visual deficit, then it's going to be this vascular, it's going to be a retinal or thalamic artery that's causing this. These, um, I call, I've, I've drawn the picture here with the entire vision occluded. In fact, these arteries respect the horizontal meridian so they can have an altitudinal deficit, not the ones that you're used to seeing, which are more homogenous and to the if it affects the branches coming back to the optic chiasm, then we have a classical bitemporal hemianopia, which we see in patients presenting with pituitary adenomas. This is a very classical presentation as well. These strokes are very uncommon. A small stroke of the branches of, of, the, uh, of the fibers that lead back to the lateral geniculate nucleus. But, but infarction of the lateral geniculate nucleus is not that uncommon. Patients who present with lenticular striate strokes patients who have the, the, or will have damage or, or a embolus that goes into the anterior, anterior coronal artery will present with this. And these patients present with very dense non-macular sparing, so the macula is included in the nucleus. As we march back from the lateral geniculate nucleus through Myers loop, we get the um, quadrantinopia is either inferior or superior, depending on where the stroke is. Sometimes it can be variable because different fibres are included. These patients often recover quite well because they haven't had a, they haven't had damage to the actual gateway of vision or to V1 primary striate regions. The further back we get, the more likely we are to see the classical macular sparing homologous hemianopia that we often see following stroke to the, the posterior circulation PCA infarct causing striate now, I, just, I did skip over this, but I, I just want to return to it. The importance of this macular sparing is that if, in, in days gone by when we didn't have CT and MRI, we knew exactly where the lesion was, and that meant it's going to be a posterior circulation stroke. It also is very important in our understanding of how the anatomy of the striate cortex has evolved. A large, the, 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 the central 22 to 30 the, that our macular vision is actually distributed over 80% of the striate cortex. So it's quite hard to infarct that entire area. This is the reason why we have macular sparing in this region. There is also evidence that there's some bilateral and ipsilateral contribution which was, has come out from uh, some researchers who did work in the late 1990s and 2000s. The other thing is that the vascular, uh, the actual vascular that region is often shared. So they might, you might be getting some middle cerebral artery. So even if you have a complete branch occlusion of the PCA, you'll be having, you'll, you'll have some sparing macular vision, which is great because our macular vision is obviously where we see why, and it's hence why conditions like macular degeneration are so disabling. So what I'd like to talk about now is just give you a brief case report to ground us in, in the sort of stroke syndromes that we talk a little bit about peripheral blindness. 
Um, this was described by Anton and Babinski. Um, they're both quite famous people in the neurology world. Babinski in particular, very special briefings that we do thousands of times a day. Um, and Anton Babinski described a number of syndromes, including this one. So this is Mr. RM, who presented to the ward um, after being presented to ICU, actually, after being found in his backyard unconscious. He was 66. When the ambulance officers eventually came because of a neighbour calling and saying you haven't seen him for three days, we don't know what's wrong with him, they found him in the backyard covered in ants, grass, leaves and excrement, which is a very strange thing for them to say, but they, they were detailed. Which of those things, ants, grass, leaves and excrement? Presumably he had been unwell for at least a couple of days and had been running around blind in his backyard um, before he was found. His GCS, his Glasgow Primary Scale on arrival, was nine. So he was fairly confused. He was he, he didn't know where he was. He wasn't obeying commands. He wasn't opening his eyes to commands. And his CT brain was very abnormal. Because he was very ill, he had um, his, he had renal failure as well. He went to ICU. We didn't get a lot of history. And we had to actually get this from his neighbours and then eventually from his family. We knew that he had type 2 diabetes because the ambulance officers had looked at his medications and that he had hypertension. We knew that he had two siblings in, in Melbourne, which is my hometown, and his, his mum eventually tracked her down and she was still alive. He resided alone, he was a musician and led a fairly alternative lifestyle all his life. He was a heavy smoker of both tobacco and cannabis and had used other drugs recreationally um, in the past but wasn't known to be addicted to any injectable. When he arrived, he was very sick. And that's, I think, important to realise. These British people have had bilateral impacts on them, and they're often very, very sick. So we're not going to be seeing them again for a long time. He was intubated, which means that he had, because he had to go to ICU for, for pressure support for his breathing. He was very, he had a very heavy smoke and he developed pneumonia in, the in his time in the backyard with the ants. And um, before he was intubated, uh, our registrar was able to examine him, found that he reacted to so she didn't detect any, and she looked for other brain stem problems. There was no evidence of any brain stem infarction, but he was, he was confused. He was withdrawing to pain, but not cooperating. He's, he's re, he had renal failure, he had troponin elevation, suggesting he had, might have had some myocardial infarction. This, would, in fact, ended up being the cause of his stroke. He developed a neural um, thrombus, and then he flipped this off with his own post-depressive circulation. So he had a heart attack. He was in ICU for two weeks because he, was, he had pneumonia, he then developed some of the organ failure and he was intubated and then had a tracheostomy. Tracheostomies are often put in if patients need to be intubated for a long period of time. And then he was eventually transferred to our ward, still with his tracheostomy, which is problematic because people can't speak. They can gesture, but they can't speak. When he came to the ward and he was better, the nursing staff commented that he was he was obeying commands, but he was often having quite bizarre responses. He wasn't mobilising as yet, but when they did get him up, he was he, he didn't appear to be following any any verbal directions in terms of where he was going and he was he was walking into things. And the nursing staff just thought that he was incoordinate because he had had some cerebellar infarction. When they were writing down, so patients with tracheostomies, we, we give them a little whiteboard to write down so they can communicate with. Sometimes his responses were quite bizarre and he was writing on top of the writing he'd already done, but it's important. He was able to write, he was able to interact. So his actual function in terms of not verbal function, his language was still normal. He was unable to use visual cues in any way. When we eventually took out his tracheostomy after three weeks, we were able to examine him better. His speech and language were normal. He, as, as, as we'd initially uh, found on his first examination, Brainstem, any evidence of brainstem infarction. He had extensive cerebellar signs, um, which I'll show you in CT in a moment. His eye movements to command were normal, but when I asked him to saccade to an object to look at me or to follow my hand, he was unable to do it. He was unable to describe anything held in front of him. He was unable to uh, describe what, who the people in the room were, but he, was act he actually volunteered responses. They were not in the least bit related to the reality of what was in the situation, but he gave very detailed responses. 
sometimes vague, but often quite detailed. Oh, there's four people in the room, and you're wearing a red dress, and the, the other person's got a blue top on. When I came to examine him, I was wearing a green dress, and he told me it was red, and I, it was obvious that this man was probably blind. Which is not surprising, because this is his CT. You can see, um, now I'm showing the CT because we, we didn't get an MRI on him acutely, and his MRI down the track show, is, has got considerable convolution. So I think it's good to see what we get when we first see them. The dark areas, for those of you seeing, not used to seeing such low resolution images, <laughs> you of the MRI generation, um, are the areas of infarction. And these are axial images, which you can see that he has bilateral striate cortical infarcts. So he has <coughs> bilateral occipital. He also has this, these are occipital images. You can see that these infarcts, particularly on the left-hand side, as a right-hand side, this is, new, this is radiological convention, go right up into his parietal cortices, these dorsal extrastriate cortices we call that in a moment. He also has cerebellar infarcts, which you can see bilaterally. And again, this is back to his cerebellar infarcts. And here, you can see there's very extensive bilateral infarction of his cortices. Um, of his striate cortices or his occipital lobes, we would say, analogy, more on the left than the right. There is some sparing of these of, of these regions, but I think that because of his other deficits, uh, he's essentially been uh, disconnected. So when I went to see him, I asked him to do some specific visual tasks. When I asked him directly, can you see me? He would reply yes, even though he couldn't. He was unable to copy, he was unable to identify he couldn't select from four, four choice options, which is something that we often do, particularly with blind sight. He couldn't detect motion. He was unable to blink to a threatening stimulus. And we, um, we explained to him that he had this syndrome. His progress in the war was difficult. He continued to have these unusual responses. He was blind. He was unable to participate in any of the therapy and we couldn't do an MRI at that stage because he was not terribly cooperative. We, ate, we sat down with him with the whole stroke unit and sat down with his brother as well and explained in detail what had happened. He sat there and he listened and he, he asked some questions and then we finished and we explained that he had massive stroke. He said very thoughtfully and considerately, that's a finish. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason why I like this line is because because he actually did understand that this had happened to someone, not to him, but to someone, and that this was a very serious event. He was able to comprehend that this was actually a serious event. And the thing about Anton's syndrome, which is political blindness, is that these people have no insight to their blindness. It's quite extraordinary. He could listen, we were able to interact with him, he could understand that these events had occurred, he went back the next day, he recounted the conversation. But the thing about cortical blindness, it's almost always associated with confabulation. Critchley actually did a beautiful description uh, in 1979 um, in one of his, his uh, books. And he talked about the fact that these patients who were described um, over the, the last century, that the patient, um, it's some days before the relative or the nursing staff stumble onto the fact that the patient has become sightless. And it's very classical, they're just walking. He furthermore misleads his entourage by behaving and talking as though he was sighted. He may try to walk through the wall or through a closed door. Suspicion is still further alerted when he begins to describe people and objects around him which are, as a matter of fact, not real at all. So I think Harim is a classical example of cortical blindness. And it seems that when both of our visual cortices are destroyed, you can see that those anterior structures were completely intact particularly in association with our dorsal pathways, which obviously come into the areas of attention because obviously the parietal regions are very important in our, in our dorsal attention networks. Patients unable to realise that they are blind, he still doesn't. And we're nine months down the track. So these people are blind but can't see that they are. What are people who are blind but actually retain a, their, an, an unconscious ability to actually see? I think too, when we think about these pe people, which are the patients who have blind sight, we need to just think about heteromotor cortices and, and these extra funicular striate pathways. All of you, I imagine, would know that there are two broad streams of connections in the visual network that we 
describe what Mugalana and Mishkan. The ventral stream, which comes um, more inferiorly into the occipitotemporal regions, projecting from V1, which is our what area, our object identification, and the where stream, emotional detection, which comes more dorsally. This is a very simple cartoon. Just to summarise this, we have V1. So we've got all the way back to V1. We've got V1 projecting forward again into the inferiotemporal cortices into, into regions that determine objects and then also having a separate stream that goes into the parietal cortices and determines and, and actually determines motion and our uh, and where things are spatially. Now this makes sense from an evolutionary perspective because this is actually one of the few areas that's myelinated at birth. So it's very important that mammals can see that there might be a threat is that not so much in the ventral regions, but in these dorsal regions, there are actually fast connections that bypass these classical pathways, those pathways that I showed you initially. So there are retinal ganglion cells that project directly to the superior colliculus, to the pulmonar and to the terminal nuclei of the accessory visual system. And there's also a retina cerebellar relay to quantine <coughs> nuclei and the inferior alveolus, the inferior organ nucleus. And this makes sense because make more sense that we have very fast pathways. If there's a predator coming to sit to, to eat us, it makes sense that we detect the motion. We don't need to know the species of wolf, we just need to know that there's a threat so we can actually start to mount our response to that threat. This is a, a more detailed um, summary of the pathways and I've, I've, I've given this reference at the end of the talk because it's actually a lovely review um, of these pathways that project from V1. So we've talked about things going back to V1 and then things going forward. But you can also see that there's actually projections that occur from the eye to the lateral geniculate nuclei independently of V1. So there is an independent visual system. Sure, it's not as important as our, our, our major striate pathway, but there's an independent visual system that projects, and it projects into these dorsal pathways. This is just a summary again showing that there's these major pathways going from the our retina into V1, but there's also independent connections that go into the superior curricula and into the pulmonary, independently actually project into, into these motion detection areas. So I'll come back to this because I think this is this again is from that that same um, that, that same summary which shows a beautiful uh, summary of these connections: the lateral the nuclei, the pulmon, the pulmonary regions, and the superior curricula. I think it's really important to remember those because patients, some people, can have retained visual function after, after lesions to the striate cortex, and this is blindsight. We know that people who are cortically blind can actually, or, or and particularly in monkeys, have done work on this 70 years ago, Kluver took out uh, the visual cortices of monkeys and showed that they still have a photic blink reflex, so they can still detect light. Optokinetic nystagmus is still retained after you've removed both the, both the visual cortices in monkeys. And it's been known for some, some time that, uh, that patients, when they're given a false choice paradigm, can accurately point in the direction of a, a flash of light, even though they say they can't see it. Blind sight was the term that was coined for this residual visual processing after the destruction of the primary visual cortex. And I think that it was something that introduced this concept of visual awareness or visual qualia without conscious vision. It's a cute term. This, 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 this uh, summary or review that was done by Cowie in 2010 said it was analogous to numb touch or to deaf hearing. The problem is that it's kind of, it had, there's a lot of baggage associated with the term and there are neuroscientists who hate it, absolutely hate it. This is a hugely controversial area. There's still, still, bickering about this to, the, to this day. So what visual functions are retained? Well, you can have retained motion perception in blind individuals. This has been known for a long time. What's actually been more later reported is that people can detect emotion, emotional faces, in their blind hemispheres as well. And that's a separate pathway. I'll talk about that in a moment. People, when people have done this, it suggests that there's retained abilities to perceive both motion and emotion without the primary visual cortex, which is quite, which is quite horrifying to a neurologist that this could actually occur. Motion perception. 
retained motion perception in the visual field of Ridox syndrome. It was most extensively studied in a single patient here um, by some excellent researchers um, in the name of G1. There's been subsequent other reports that have actually um, that have bolstered these findings because there were there was criticisms about these initial reports saying it's just one person. How do we know? But there's been publications now that, that, that have actually shown that this is true, and this is in fact something that's been known for some time. So the Riddick syndrome report was actually described by an army surgeon in 1917. So this is something that's been described for a long time by neurologists and neuroscientists. One of the issues about what has made it so controversial is because when it was first published, the paradigms that were used to, to study this um, were, were criticised quite heavily for some good and some bad reasons. What I think really cemented the, the Riddick syndrome and the concept of motion perception is, is retained is, is a, a lovely fMRI study that was done in 98 on GY, which revealed, unsurprisingly, because we now know the anatomy, that there's extensive dorsal extra striate, dorsal extra striate activation. So if you think about it, that makes sense. They're still detecting motion because of these extra dinico striate pathways. There's still projections to these, these motion detection regions, so you're still getting activation in there. And in fact, this has then been described and shown in patients following stroke recovery as well. What was interesting about this study is that there was quite extensive medullary activation, in particular activator system. Now, there's a lot of reasons that that might have occurred, but it was very interesting. It was the first time that a brainstem site had been implicated in conscious visual processing. And it really fueled the debate on perception, awareness, and consciousness, which I won't go into. I'm too young to do consciousness. You've got to be looking older and being more philosophical with people who tend to do consciousness studies when they're older, or are just natural philosophers. But it makes sense that this should occur. It makes sense that the that, that, that patients should have some retained motion perception. Even if V1's gone, we haven't actually ablated the lateral genital nuclei, the superior funiculi, the pulmonary regions. So it makes sense that they would have this retained ability. Obviously, it only makes sense now because of all the work that's been done and the people have studied these patients extensively and actually described the anatomy. Prior to doing this, the work was done in monkeys, but hasn't been done, wasn't done in humans. And I think it's advent of excellent imaging that has allowed us to do this. So what about emotional blindsight? How do patients, how, how, have, have, how can people actually perceive emotional faces in the absence of V1? And this was a, this, this also came about in papers that were published about a year later and de Galda reported in colleagues that emotional faces were processed in blind hemispheres. So this is a different pathway to the ones that we've already just described. <clears throat> the term affective blindsight was coined. Another key term. It's for our most terms. Just don't think most, but the basic neuroscientists don't like to use it. And in fact did another series of, of beautiful experiments showing that these patients have amygdala activation. So they did a number of experiments using a, a number of different modalities, but also using fMRI, showing really lovely amygdala activation. And they're, they're, this group has actually subsequently shown that, that you can get amygdala activation in blind hemifields in association with eye contact alone. So just by looking at someone, that, 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 that the amygdala can detect that eye contact is actually occurring in the blind hemifield. So it appears that the amygdala response to eye contact doesn't require any primary visual cortex. And this, again, is something that was quite controversial when it was, when it was published and discussed. And it really did promote a whole, a whole set of studies looking at how this could be. And we now know that the visual and emotional system is extensively interconnected, especially subcortical. The superior funiculus, again, this important structure, is connected to the, to the amygdala via the pulpina, independently of V1. It's in fact the earliest post-retinal subcortical structure that responds to low spatial frequency emotional stimuli. So I still find this astonishing that there's a, a, a something that can be detecting actual objects without V1, without having to go through the gating that's there. So it's amazing that there's this little other visual centre that can do this. There's also direct connections that exist between the amygdala and into the orbital frontal cortex, anterior cingulate cortices, 
and thence into other areas, into the insula, which are very important for social cognition. So this emotional and social cognition are extensively linked. Again, this is from the review by Tamieto and Gelder, which is in 2010, and it shows a summary of these pathways. We look back into the pulvin and it appears that there's independent projections. We don't even have V1 on this picture. They go directly into the amygdala and then anteriorly. So there's, there's ways of the, the body, the, the human brain, and, and there's, there's evidence that this is in primates and some lesser vertebrates, can actually detect facial emotion in the absence of primary visual cortex, which I think is an extraordinary thing. So there's at least two other systems that work independently of our classical visual pathways. The reason why I put this back up again is because these patients presenting with strokes are uncommon. If patients have infarcts that affect the lateral temporal nucleus, either, either an infarct that has a reticular striate infarct or an anterior choroidal artery, these people do not have blind sight. So it appears that these subcortical structures, these subcortical structures are absolutely, these gates are, in, are, are absolutely essential. We can get rid of V1 and still have some retained visual ability in some people, I should emphasize, not all. Um, but if we if we remove these gating structures, that ability is gone. So, to summarize, cortical blindness is the absence of vision in the absence of insight. They're blind, but they don't know it. And I think that this only occurs in patients with extensive bilateral damage, often with damage to the new. The other is perceived blindness. The patient says, I can't see, I have no consciousness of seeing. The enforced choice paradigm is able to accurately detect emotion and is able to accurately detect emotion. These retained visual functions are largely gated by the lateral temporal nuclei, superior folliculus, and the pulmonar. And I think it's really important because without an understanding of this really complex, fascinating neuroanatomy, we wouldn't understand this. These are two, I've, I've given two references, but I think that you're going to have these um, for uh, two reviews or papers that I think discuss blind sight really beautifully. Um, they're more review papers. And there's also, I've given you two reviews or papers that discuss cortical blindness at the end. Because I think that those, those images are really important. And if you read them extensively, these are really fascinating papers. This is still controversial. This is still a topic of debate. Um, but I think that what's happened so far is that the bait in this is really